So I'm going to give you a very short introduction to Article 14 to help you understand how the talks that we're about to hear fit in with the overall framework of that right. Now, um, this is what Article 14 uh, says. It says the enjoyment of rights and freedoms set forth in this convention shall be secured without discrimination on any ground. Um, and then it gives some uh, particular examples of those grounds or any other status. And I'll talk through a bit about what that means in a moment. But broadly, Article 14 enshrines uh, protection against discrimination in the enjoyment of rights set out in the convention itself. And although perhaps it's sometimes overlooked um, by, um, by claimants, the court itself, the European Court at least, has, has held that the principle of non-discrimination um, is a of a fundamental nature and underlies the convention all, all, um, as a whole, uh, you know, along with things like the rule of law and valid values of tolerance. And so it, it, it's important, shouldn't be overlooked um, and certainly been affirmed by the court. Now, it's important to understand about Article 14 that it's an ancillary right. So it doesn't, it's not, it has no independent existence, no existence independent from the other rights set out in the convention. So, um, you know, for example, it doesn't simply prohibit discrimination in general, um, but it must be discrimination in the enjoyment of the rights set forth in the convention. Now, again, importantly, it's, um, it's not necessary to make a case under Article 14 to show that your rights under any of the other substantive articles of the convention have been violated. Don't, you don't need to go that far. Um, you just really need to show that they're engaged. And where Article 14 talks about rights and freedoms, it is not just talking about the substantive provisions of the convention, um, but also additional rights which would be said to fall within the wider ambit of any of those um, substantive uh, provisions or articles. So that might be something that the state has that comes within the ambit of that, that the state has voluntarily decided to provide. And as you can see on the slide there, a really good example are um, appellate courts. There's nothing in Article 6 of the Convention that requires a state to provide a system of appellate courts, but states may choose to do so. And where they do so, that then uh, falls within the ambit of Article 6. And any discriminatory treatment in respect of the provision of access to such appellate courts would engage Article 14. Now, there are several different types of discrimination that have been recognised by the court. Um, the first and most obvious is direct discrimination, which is where you treat people um, uh, of uh, in analogous or, or um, uh, Rele relevantly similar situations in a different way based on a particular uh, characteristic or status. I mean the examples are probably the best way of understanding these forms of discrimination. So example here from I think it's from Romania where uh, female offenders who've been uh, convicted and sentenced to um, a spell of imprisonment were able to defer their term of imprisonment for um, uh, up to a year until the date of any child's first birthday, so they were able to spend their first birthday with 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 their uh, with their child. Um, the applicant complained as a man, he he was not able to benefit from um, from that uh, policy, and as a result, he'd been discriminated against on the basis of his sex, and the court agreed with that. Um, indirect discrimination is where um, a measure which purports to be neutral and, and treat everyone uh, the same actually ends up having a disproportionate prejudicial effect on, on one, one particular group or, 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 or people with a shared characteristic. So the example I've given there is from Czech, the Czech Republic where some legislation um, imposed national testing a bit like the 11 plus to determine uh, uh, school placements the scoring for that test had been based on the mainstream population and it didn't take into account some special characteristics of, of Roma children um, to, do, to do with their various things to do with their upbringing but as a result it meant that they were particularly likely to perform poorly in um, these exams and therefore be placed in worse schools so and it was found that that therefore amounted to indirect discrimination. And then you have discrimination by association, 
um, which is a situation where a protected uh, where the protected ground in question relates to another person somehow connected with you so again the example is helpful here um, the failure to take into account the needs of a person's disabled child when determining that person's eligibility for tax relief um, was a form of uh, discrimination by association because the person who was affected wasn't discriminated against themselves but they were by association with a, per a disabled person and then positive action article 14 um, doesn't prohibit what's quite widely known as positive discrimination um, so whereby a state tr can treat uh, groups differently in order to correct what are described as factual inequalities between them and indeed certain circumstances a failure to, to, to positively discriminate can give rise to a breach of article 14 and again an example is in the UK uh, there were some tax advantages that were given to women um, who worked as the main breadwinner in their family um, they they were more beneficial than the advantages that were given to men but it was found that was uh, perfectly lawful because um, the state had an objective and reasonable justification um, for providing uh, uh, positive discrimination in favour of married women uh, who worked. Um, then uh, you move on to uh, the basis for uh, discrimination. So Article 14 doesn't prohibit all differences in treatment, obviously, but only those based on objective, identifiable uh, personal characteristics or status. And again, we'll hear more about um, status, I think, from Admas in his talk. Um, discrimination, as I said, must, you know, must be based on, on a status. It's clearly, some of them are listed in the convention. You've got that list there in the second bullet, but then you have this other category of other status. And those, uh, that, those words have been given quite a wide meaning by the court um, and their interpretation hasn't even been limited to um, characteristics which are personal. So some which are personal are in those examples like sexual orientation, age, uh, gender orientation, disability, but immigration status is not a personal um, characteristic, but nevertheless, it would fall within the um, term uh, other status for the purposes of Article 14. Um, then you have the test for discrimination. Um, obviously, uh, not all differences in treatment constitute discrimination um, because then obviously you couldn't have things like job interviews, um, but only those devoid of an objective and reasonable justification. So it is possible to discriminate so long as you can justify it. And um, we're obviously going to have talks from um, uh, from Hasta and Richard on justification um, and when deciding cases of discrimination uh, the court applies this test so has there been a difference in treatment of persons in analogous or relevantly similar situations um, and, and that other person the person you're being compared with is, is referred to as the comparator and again Admas is going to talk to us a bit more about comparators um, and if that is the case then is that difference objectively justified so does it pursue a legitimate aim are the means uh, employed reasonably proportionate? So familiar language there for those who, who work in the human rights um, field. Um, but to note that um, obviously there, there is a wide margin of appreciation given in some circumstances, particularly in respect of measures which touch on social and economic grounds. And that's where the manifestly without reasonable foundation comes in. So that's, that's the court giving member states a wider uh, margin of appreciation in those areas and, and Richard's is going to talk about that and that is a run through a real really uh, quick run through of um, article 14 hopefully that helps you to, to, to work out uh, where all the different um, talks uh, fit together and now Sam is going to talk to us about AMBIT Right, thank you very much, Ben. So, uh, AMBIT uh, and Article 14. As Ben said, uh, it's now established and uncontroversial that Article 14 is not a freestanding anti-discrimination provision, provided only that it is on the ground of a status. Um, but uh, because the discrimination must relate to the enjoyment of one of the substantive uh, 
ECHR rights. A common and perhaps the most common article cited in connection with Article 14 is Article 8, uh, particularly so far as the right to respect for private and family life and home is concerned. Um, however, other reasonably common partners include uh, particularly Article 1, Protocol 1, property rights, um, but there are, of course, others. No violation of the substantive right is needed because, of course, if that was the case, uh, then Article uh, 14 would largely be devoid of effect. Uh, and it's well established that the test uh, is that set out, for example, in STEC, um, that it is necessary but also sufficient for the facts of the case to fall within the ambit of one or more of the ECHR articles. So what does ambit mean? The case law has determined that certain matters fall within the ambit of specific articles. For example, it is now well established that the denial of a contributory social security benefit falls within the ambit of Article 1, uh, Protocol 1. But the other way of looking at it, and this is one of the areas in which um, advocates have been uh, quite creative over the years, um, is to fit it into what's called the modality um, mechanism. And so, uh, for example, um, this has existed for a while, and I think it was first set out in Petrovich in Austria, that another way of putting the relationship between Article 14 and the substantive convention rights is that Article 14 comes into play whenever the subject matter of the disadvantage constitutes one of the modalities of the exercise of the right guaranteed. And a modality is the way in which something is done or expressed. So, for example, in relation to Article 8, it is the way in which the state expresses its support for family life. And um, that is, uh, there's a quote from uh, Lord Nichols in M and the Secretary of State of Works and Pensions um, here. So this has been seen uh, particularly in the context of um, uh, discrimination claims uh, where benefits are concerned because traditionally, and uh, as I said at the beginning, it's been well established that, that a, a range of benefits um, fall within the ambit of Article 1, Protocol 1, but people have been increasingly arguing that they also fall within the ambit of Article 8 and uh, with some success. A recent case, relatively recent case on all that is McLaughlin, uh, which was a, a case in which a father complained that a non-contributory parental leave allowance was only available to mothers and um, uh, not to uh, fathers. And uh, the analysis of the Supreme Court in that case uh, was to look squarely at the modality argument and, in, and they concluded um, that this particular benefit was a way in which the state expressed um, their respect for family life. And so accordingly, it was appropriate, both the majority and the minority agreed that it was appropriate to look at Article 14 in the context of Article 8, as well as Article 1, uh, Protocol 1. It is fair to say, though, that the English courts have made rather heavy weather of um, the point about ambit, particularly in connection with Article 8, because it is rather broad and ill-defined um, in scope. And other authorities, it has led the courts to try and uh, deal with arguments such as whether or not one is, has to identify the core values which the provision is intended to protect. And there is a line of case law which looks at um, the core value um, and whether or not uh, that is sufficient. However, Baroness Hale in McLaughlin said, be a bit careful uh, with looking or relying on just core values 
uh, because that is a domestic construct and is not actually something that arises necessarily um, out of the convention itself and indeed some of those cases are under appeal. But to finish on AMBIT, there are two um, cases that uh, demonstrate opposite uh, ends of the spectrum, I would suggest. So uh, in DA, which is one of the benefit cap cases that was determined, I think, in about May uh, last year, um, Lord Wilson, who gave the majority judgment, uh, took quite an expansive approach to the question of AMBIT and whether or not um, the benefit cap fell within the ambit of Article 8 and therefore um, could consider the matter under Article 8, and, sorry, Article 14 taken in conjunction with Article 8. And he said that it cannot seriously be disputed that the values underlying the right of all appellants to respect for their family life include those of a home life underpinned by a degree of stability, practical as well as emotional, and thus by financial resources adequate to meet basic needs in particular for accommodation, warmth, food, food and clothing. And this is quite a broad approach, uh, which um, two of us on this panel uh, tried to persuade the High Court uh, meant um, that in the circumstances where uh, NHS treatment um, is chargeable to groups of people without um, ordinary residents and chargeable in particular in respect um, of children of migrants in this case, that the effect of the charge hanging over the head of the family as a result of some urgent treatment that was required to save the child's life, in fact, uh, that, there, that there was um, an Article 14 in conjunction with Article 8 uh, argument. And, uh, but uh, the High Court disagreed and it held that the impact uh, did not come within the ambit of Article 8 and it was at best an indirect connection and that although there was emotional upset and feelings of guilt uh, involved by the child who had been ill and therefore caused the parent to have this enormous debt um, that did not have the required quality of seriously and directly impinging uh, or such that it requires to be included within the ambit of Article 8. So there you have two opposite uh, end. So there are obviously limits, notwithstanding the broad concept. Thank you. I'll now um, hand over to um, Advas. Thank you very much, Sam. So I'm going to speak about uh, status and comparators. And a useful way to understand uh, the context of these topics is to um, <clears throat> is against the uh, backdrop of the four stage process that the court will follow in inquiring into uh, and evaluating whether there's been a violation of Article 14. And the four stages are set out there on the screen. Um, Sam's dealt with AMBIT, and that's question one that has to be answered affirmatively. <clears throat> and then the second question is whether the treatment is on the ground of some recognised status, and the third, whether the situation of the claimant is analogous to that of some other person who's been treated differently, and then ultimately you get onto the proportionality analysis. So a prompt, normally in, in the ordinary run of cases, the prompt for a discrimination claim is going to be some difference in treatment. So one way of looking at steps one to three is as a series of obstacles that the claimant will need to overcome in order to invite the court to consider the proportionality of a difference in treatment. So dealing first with, with status, which is um, very much the media topic and will take up um, a little more of, of my time. Discrimination by definition is on some ground and that's encapsulated in the extract from Lord Walker's judgment in Carson that's on the screen there. It, by definition has a logic to it and that's what makes it discrimination. So under Article 14, discrimination is prohibited on any grounds such as sex, race, colour, etc. So you have a list of specified grounds or on the ground of any other status. Now, if a claim 
a discrimination claim falls within one of the specified grounds, that's a relatively straightforward uh, question in, in terms of establishing status, and uh, one can move on to the third stage of dealing with comparators. What I'm going to focus on here is the question of what is meant by any other status. And the key points are set out there. The key authority is the Supreme Court decision in Stott. And there are two um, key propositions. First, the test is a broad one. And we see there, so Lord Justice Henderson and Stevenson describing it as a requirement that's diminished almost to vanishing point. And we'll see that there's some force in that observation. And second, the boundaries of the test are not entirely clear, notwithstanding the relatively recent decision of the Supreme Court. And we'll explore that a little too. It's important to note with the uh, analysis under Article 14 that while it's broken up for analytical purposes into four stages, these stages are not hermetically sealed and there is some interplay between them. So the question of status will um, feed into uh, the proportionality analysis and the broader claim in certain ways. It's important, for example, that the status pleaded must actually capture the entirety of the discrimination that's alleged. And there's quite a neat example of that in the um, two child limit case, uh, Paris 70 to 77. I just include that there for reference. I won't go into that in detail now. Um, a more important um, uh, conceptual um, accompaniment to uh, the, the issue of states and how it fits into proportionality are the concentric circles that were referred to by Lord Walker in the RJM case. And essentially what what this says is um, Lord Walker essentially describes a hierarchy of different statuses, so to speak, with those innate, immutable uh, characteristics, gender, uh, sexual orientation, uh, congenital disabilities, as calling for a weightier justification, whereas those that are more peripheral, more debatable, uh, uh, being um, discrimination on those grounds being a little easier to justify or requiring less weighty reasons. That's a domestic law um, conceptual structure that's been uh, quite consistently applied uh, under Article 14. So moving on to what is meant by any other status, before we get on to the broadest that is um, uh, found in the case law uh, more currently, it's important to be aware by way of context that there's a focus in earlier, particularly in earlier um, Strasbourg authorities on personal characteristics as a guide to the concept of status. And this extract in particular from um, Sheldon's case is cited repeatedly that um, what one looks for is a personal characteristic by which persons or groups of persons are distinguishable from each other. Now, I would deprecate reliance on this as a guide to the concept of status because, well, first of all, it's somewhat circular and, and not much of a guide, but the approach described and what's implied, we will see, is actually very difficult to reconcile with where the case law has got to. Now, the current test is a broad one. Uh, Strasbourg a Court in Clift said that it's not limited to uh, immutable or innate characteristics and that is quite clear from the uh, cases in which a status has been found. There are some examples listed on that slide there but for example country of residence, immigration status, homelessness, being a prisoner who is serving a sentence of over 15 years and so forth. So what's, in order to understand the conceptual basis for these different um, categories that we found to be statuses, it's, um, we'll start by considering um, the Supreme Court case in Stott. So in Stott, the majority held that being a prisoner serving a um, extended determinate sentence, that's a particular kind of sentence provided for in statute, was a status for the purposes of Article 14. Why did it matter and, and why did the court um, arrive at that particular conclusion? Well, the argument of the claimant was that prisoners serving an extended determinate sentence um, were subjected to 
uh, more restrictive early release provisions than prisoners serving other kinds of sentences. Uh, the two comparators were prisoners serving ordinary determinate sentences and prisoners serving discretionary life sentences. So it was really out of the nature of the discrimination claim that was being made that the need to conceptualise the prisoner as having that kind of status arose. The Supreme Court dismissed the challenge on um, proportionality and comparators, but it found that that was a status for the purposes of Article 14. Now it's clear simply from the facts of Stott and the court's conclusion that the test is a wide one, but let's attempt to uh, dig a little deeper in terms of what is laid down as a matter of principle. Well, it's clear simply from the words of Article 14 that the requirement of status must add something to the four stage test. It's also clear from Stott and from other cases that the mere difference in treatment does not by itself constitute a status that follows really from the first point. Lady Black and Stott, who wrote the leading judgment, emphasised that there was a need to consider the situation as a whole. So look at the situation in the round. So, so far, so general. One central question that was raised in Stott is, is there a requirement that the differential treatment exist independently of the status concerned? In uh, an earlier important case uh, called Clift, which also dealt with the uh, 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 treatment of um, prisoners, the House of Lords answered that there was such a requirement. That case went to the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court answered that there was no such requirement. And it's helpful to uh, uh, recall the facts of Clift uh, to, to understand uh, that conclusion. The claimant in Clift was a prisoner who was serving a sentence of 15 years and the statutory scheme provided that if a prisoner ser was serving a sentence of 15 years or more then the question of their release on parole was decided not by the parole board but by the Secretary of State. So there was therefore an article 14 uh, claim made on the basis that, that was discrimination as between Mr Clift and another prisoner who was serving a sentence of less than 15 years. And that was found to be a status by the European Court of Human Rights. The requirement that differential treatment exists independently of the status was also relied on by the Supreme Court in the case of uh, Doherty. So what did the Supreme Court in Stott have to say about this central issue? Well, they somewhat uh, avoided it, it might be said. Lady Black, so looking at the majority in Stott, Lady Black deprecated the criterion. She emphasised, her uh, leadership emphasised that it was um, difficult to apply and not based on, on any authority, but ultimately concluded it did not arise on the facts because in any event, the claim of Mr Stott did meet that criterion. His, uh, the difference in treatment was independent of his status. Uh, Lord Hodge simply uh, uh, found that the status test was met but um, ex expressed no desire to make broader comments on the state of the law. Lady Hale also concluded the test was met uh, on the basis that Stott had better facts than Clift for meeting the status. Lord Mance of the majority took the clearest position in principle in, 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 in implicitly if not directly rejecting the criteria. Lord Mann said that there's no reason why a person may not be identified as having a particular status, even where the aim is to discriminate against them on the ground of that status. So that's uh, implicitly uh, uh, against the proposition that the status needs to be independent from the difference in treatment. But Lord Mann's also concluded that it did not arise on the facts because Mr Stock's status was in fact, independent from the difference in treatment. So what this boils down to really is what is the relationship between status and difference in treatment? And the tension here is between the need to identify a ground for the difference in treatment, which is not simply, descri not simply describing the difference in treatment itself. The problem with that approach is that it essentially nullifies the status criteria. 
it leaves it adding nothing. On the other hand, the courts are reluctant to adopt an overly restrictive um, approach to Article 14. And in Stott, Lord Mount also said that status did not need to have social or legal importance outside of the difference in treatment. The example given by Lord Mounts is of somebody who holds, uh, for example, a religious or a political opinion, uh, which they, who held such an opinion at one point, but no longer hold it. Uh, discrimination on the basis of them holding that opinion, on the perception that they hold it, would still be considered discrimination, notwithstanding that for the victim themselves, that opinion may not be relevant in their own lives. The cases that post-state stots suggest that this tension between uh, not reducing status to nothing, but yet uh, deciding what the relationship is between state and difference in treatment is a complex one, which hasn't really been resolved. So cases that test the boundaries, some more, more extreme uh, examples, uh, 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 Mattison and Powell, which are um, listed there, and that was, Mattison was a, a Supreme Court case with Lord Wilson um, giving the main judgment. It was a challenge by a child with disabilities whose parents' disability living allowance ceased once the child had been an inpatient in hospital for more than 84 days. So that was the discrimination that was being complained about. And as a status, well, the status put forward and accepted by Lord Mattis was a child hospitalised free of charge in an NHS hospital for a period longer than 84 days. So it's quite clear there that the status is almost, is practically a mirror image of the discrimination that's being uh, complained of. And Paolo Pi Slovakia is a um, European court case uh, essentially to, to the same effect. So one sees the um, objection that might be made there that in essence status is being reduced uh, to, to adding almost nothing of substance. Some examples there of cases where status has not been found. Um, introduction of a sentencing regime for prisoners sentenced after a particular date. So the fact that the law takes effect on a particular date and somebody is going to be affected differently before that date and after that date has been found to not represent a status both in the European court and in the domestic court. Differences between different geographical locations in the UK don't constitute a status. Post-Stott, the cases uh, citing it seem to fall into three broad categories. Um, one category simply take the case as authority for states being very broad. Um, a second category simply uh, say, take the position that status is complicated, let's assume it and deal with proportionality. And there are also cases which have, in which arguments have been made for a more restrictive approach essentially re-arguing the issues that Stott was considering. And that of course suggests that Stott hasn't been, uh, hasn't clarified the law in, in respect of whether those restrictive approaches still uh, uh, apply. I've um, put in a reference there to DA, which has already been referred to, and that's an example of a case where you see some of these different approaches to how Stott is to be applied with, with a majority um, uh, expressing doubts about the extent of the test. So that's status and moving on uh, quick, uh, quite um, quickly to comparators. So we're now at stage three having established status and a difference in treatment uh, logically um, is defined in relation to a comparator group. So the claimants must be comparing themselves to somebody or some group who are said to receive more favorable Trade, um, treatment than the claimant. And in a nutshell, what has to be shown is that the situations of the claimant or the claimant group and the comparator group are similar in all relevant respects apart from the ground of alleged discrimination. Otherwise, there is no discrimination. And in asking the question of whether the claimant and the comparator group are similar in all relevant respects, the court will look to the essence of the substantive right and ask in, in the, against the backdrop of that substantive right, is the claimant and the comparator group in a relevantly similar um, position? Now, comparators, unless the, unless the case can obviously be 
thrown out on comparison, unless the claim is comparing apples and oranges, it's often elided with justification. And um, uh, there's a, a, a Carson is, is authority for that. It's the judgment of Lord Nichols, the saying essentially the court's focus may be better directed at justification where the issue of comparison isn't an obvious, um, uh, where there isn't an obvious answer that there is no comparison between the two. Examples where uh, the claims have failed the comparative stage of the analysis. In the two child um, uh, limit cases, a, a challenge to the imposition of a two child limit uh, to those receiving um, child tax um, credits and, and, and other benefits. A discrimination argument on the basis of on the status of children failed because the comparative of children was adults and adults did not receive the benefit in question, child tax credit. So there was no basis for comparing uh, uh, children with adults. So that, that argument was not successful. Carson's another clear example, non-resident persons in the UK, not analogous to those resident in the UK for the purposes of pension provision because the former did not contribute to the UK economy and pay tax, whereas the latter did. So again, that's a um, apples and oranges comparison situation and there's no need to go on to the proportionality analysis. So that brings to uh, uh, an end the talk on status and comparatives. I've just set out some key points there. On status, the test is broad, but the boundaries of it are not clear. The key case is the Supreme Court decision is stopped. Status must be pleaded to capture the entirety of discrimination alleged and it should not simply recite the difference in treatments, but as we've seen, the boundaries of that are not entirely clear. And the nature of the status will bear on the extent of the justification required. For comparators, the situation of the claimant and the comparator group must be similar in all relevant respects. And unless the comparator case is obviously wrong, the court would normally consider this with proportionality. So that brings an end uh, to an end of my talk, and it's now proportionality that's up next. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, Admas. Um, I'll be um, talking about um, the final stage of an article that you claim, namely justification, uh, and providing it a short introduction um, before Richard Gravel speaks about um, the manifestly without reasonable foundation test. Um, now, as um, Ben said at the start, um, not all differences of treatment um, violate Article 14. A difference of treatment will only violate um, Article 14 if, in the words of the European Court, it has no objective and reasonable justification. Now, the European Court um, has um, itself elaborated that test um, in, in relatively simple terms. It said um, that there is no objective and reasonable justification for a difference in treatment if it does not pursue a legitimate aim, or if there is not a reasonable relationship of proportionality between uh, the means employed uh, and the aim sought to be realized. Now, domestically, uh, the classic formulation of uh, the test uh, for justification uh, is found um, in the case of Bank Mallet, and, and it's Lord Reed's formulation, which poses um, four questions. Uh, which will no doubt be very familiar. Uh, and we'll look at those more closely in a moment. Um, but uh, what Lord Reed observed um, in Bank Mallet was um, that in practice, um, the European Court had often or generally approached uh, the matter of justification uh, in a relatively broad brush way. Um, and that was in contrast um, to the more structured approach um, in domestic case law, uh, which he um, said was consistent with um, the common law tradition. And his formulation, which um, you can see there, is really uh, in a similar vein, or in the same vein. Um, and he commended um, the formulation um, in the terms which you can see in the first bullet point. He said it was um, uh, its attraction as a tool was that by breaking down an assessment of proportionality into distinct elements, 
it can clarify different aspects of such an assessment um, and make value judgments more explicit. Um, now, Bank Mellet wasn't, in fact, an Article 14 case, uh, but the formulation um, which we've just looked at there um, has been used um, as a test um, for assessing justification under Article 14. Um, and the reason I'm careful um, to emphasise that it's been used as a test is because um, in the words of Lord Wilson in the DA case, um, since Bank Mallet, um, there has been a, a mapping of a different path, at least um, in the context of challenges um, to economic measures introduced um, by the executive um, or the legislature. Uh, and um, before the Bank Mallet case, um, manifestly without reasonable foundation, had um, been treated as a distinct test of justification in the social security context. Uh, and the question which has troubled the courts um, since Bank Mallet um, is what part, if any, this formula has um, to play in assessing justification in the context of um, socioeconomic policy. Uh, and its relationship to the conventional bank mallet test. Now, I won't say anything more about that now because um, Richard Drabble will be speaking on that very shortly. So looking um, more closely um, at the bank mallet test, um, as we saw, it poses four questions. Um, the first three are, are really addressed to in interrogating um, the public interest. And the first question is, um, does the impugned measure have a legitimate aim? Now, in practice, that's not a particularly difficult hurdle um, to surmount. A, a recent case um, which failed on this basis was the case of Gillam, which is a case about the whistleblowing judge. It was a claim um, by a district judge who um, alleged that she'd suffered various detriments. Um, because um, she had made complaints about the effects of various cost-cutting um, measures. Um, and, but she wasn't able to avail herself of legislation which protected um, employees uh, and workers um, from detriment on the, where they'd made protected disclosures because the judicial office holder was neither an employee uh, nor were they a worker. Uh, and um, the Supreme Court um, found that um, there was no justification for the exclusion of ju um, judicial um, office holders. And that was on the basis um, that uh, the uh, defendant had advanced um, no legitimate aim uh, for failing to extend the protection um, of the legislation to judges. In fact, on a proper analysis, um, uh, my view is that what the um, court was really saying was that there was no rational connection um, between um, the impugned measure, namely the failure to extend protection um, to judges um, and the aim that was apparently being uh, pursued, um, which was um, the protection of judicial independence. Uh, and the Supreme Court, um, after an, a careful analysis, um, just said that it failed to see um, how um, that um, uh, was, uh, that the, particular, the exclusion of judges was furthered um, by uh, the particular aim that was being pursued. Um, the third question um, is whether a less intrusive measure could have been used to achieve um, that aim. And in Bank um, Mallet, um, uh, Lord Reed did emphasise that it was important um, to afford a margin of appreciation in respect of that question to the dec decision maker. Uh, uh, and he quoted um, from a US case in, in, which it said, in which it was said that a judge um, would be unimaginative indeed if he could not come up with something a little less drastic or a little less restrictive in almost any situation. Um, but what I wanted to focus uh, a little more on is um, the fourth question, which is uh, where in practice the battleground tends to be. Uh, and that's whether or not the, there is a fair balance um, between uh, the rights of the individual and the interests of the community. Um, uh, so that, that will entail a balancing exercise between competing interests. 
Um, and I set out on this slide and the next um, a, a number of considerations that, that have been taken into account, particularly in some recent cases, but certainly it shouldn't be seen as an exhaustive um, list because, of course, Article 14 cases arise um, in an infinite variety of situations. Uh, but a relevant consideration um, uh, is um, the nature of the measure um, and the context. So in matters of socioeconomic policy, um, the courts uh, will afford um, greater weight to the judgment um, of the um, executive or the legislature. Um, and the extent of the area of judgment will depend on the particular branch uh, of the state involved. So where it's uh, an act of parliament, there'll be a, a greater area of judgment. Uh, the degree of economic uh, or social policy involved um, and uh, in the JCWAI case, um, which Justin uh, will be talking about, um, Lord Justice Hickenbottom said um, that where there is a substantial degree of economic and or social policy involved in a measure, uh, the degree of deference must be accorded great weight because of the wide margin of judgment that, that the, they have um, in such matters. Um, and another relevant consideration will be the extent to which the executive or legislature have addressed their minds to potential adverse effects. Uh, and going back to the case of Gillam, um, so the case of a whistleblowing judge, um, the Supreme Court um, noted that, uh, in fact, um, there had been um, no real consideration given by the legislature uh, to um, the exclusion of judges from the whistleblowing. Um, uh, uh, legislation and so there was in truth no considered opinion to defer to. Um, other relevant considerations will be uh, what the ground or grounds of discrimination are uh, and ADMAS has already touched on this um, but discrimination on certain so-called suspect grounds um, will call for more stringent scrutiny. So those include sex, race and sexual orientation, in some cases, reference is also made to nationality and religion. Uh, so where those are the grounds of discrimination, weightier reasons will be required to justify uh, any potential discrimination. Um, and others, uh, other relevant considerations include the extent to which uh, the measure achieves the aim pursued uh, and the adverse effects of um, the measure, or to put it another way, the nature and level of the discrimination. And those were both um, features of the um, Court of Appeals analysis in, in the JCWAI case, which um, Justin will be considering. Uh, and finally, um, another uh, relevant consideration is or can be the obligations uh, under uh, international conventions. Um, so in the A and Health Secretary case, um, and this very briefly, was a challenge um, to the health secretary's um, failure um, to extend um, abortion services free of charge to women um, coming to the UK who were resident in Northern Ireland. Uh, and in that case, um, the uh, Supreme Court um, accepted um, that uh, the fairness or justification um, for the measure um, could be considered through the prism of the relevant international conventions which included CEDAW uh, and also uh, recommendations of the international committees, although in the end um, this wasn't enough to outweigh the, the particular aim that was being pursued in that case. Um, so I'll now pass on to Richard Grabble who will um, be speaking about the Manifestly Without Reasonable Foundation test. I found this talk is about Manifestly Without Reasonable Foundation, which is uh, the way in which these courts have described the test at the proportionality stage that's applied to um, uh, particularly benefit claims. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a concept which, with which I've had a very long history of involvement uh, going back some years. Uh, and what I want to do in the talk, in the sort of 10 minutes or so that I've got, is to develop the, situ the description of the situation that we've now arrived at, 
which um, can be described uh, both domestically um, and in terms of very recent developments in Strasbourg. Ironically, I think we're getting to a situation, as I shall try to explain, where the Strasbourg situation is, um, is so the Strasbourg situation has taken on a rather surprising twist, but the domestic situation is starting to develop signs of a synthesis of resolution of all the issues. Now, the very first side that I've set up is the description of the original cases. STEC, which is in about 2006, RGM, which is in 2009, and Humphreys, which is in 2012. All of those cases assumed uh, that in the consideration, consideration of whether discrimination uh, alleged to be contrary to Article 14 was proportionate, it was appropriate to apply the manifestly without reasonable foundation test. The origin being the observations in STEC by the Strasbourg Court that it was appropriate to accord member states a wide margin of appreciation in matters of social and economic policy. Not, in none of the three cases was the issue of the test for proportionality actually argued out. And they all have features which will resound later on in the analysis, as we shall see in a few minutes' time. So just to remind ourselves what STEC was about, STEC was a case where there was a complaint of sex discrimination, um, where the UK had ended entitlement to a benefit known as special hardship allowance, a non-contributory benefit, and replaced it with entitlement to a reduced earnings allowance, also a non-contributory benefit, but at different ages uh, for men and women, depending on pension age. Um, and the argument advanced by the claimant was that this was a new benefit situation and the basic discrimination on differential pension ages couldn't be justified. The major issue in STEC was whether or not non-contributory benefits fell within the ambit of Article 1, Protocol 1 at all, so as to bring in an Article 14 case. That was answered in favour of the claimants, and it was almost by a sidewind uh, that the court articulated the test for justification in manifestly without reasonable foundation terms. In RJM, we got to the laws, the major domestic issue was, first of all, uh, whether the STEC approach to whether, um, uh, to, uh, whether uh, non-contributory benefits fell within the ambit of A1P1 should be followed domestically. And secondly, whether homelessness was an appropriate status on the lines that Admas has outlined. Once again, the court just assumed, and it wasn't argued, to the contrary, that the appropriate approach was the STEC approach and manifestly without reasonable foundation. In Humphreys, the issue was whether the failure to provide any means-tested benefit for dad, who was looking after the children three days a week, whereas mum, who was looking after the children four days a week, got the whole of the children's element, whether that was discriminatory on an Article 14 basis. Once again, no analysis of whether uh, the uh, test really what or should be manifestly without reasonable foundation. The court, the, the cases are important if, if it, in this respect now, as we shall see in just a moment. In STEC, because the issue was about tying the benefit to differential pension aiders, the issue was whether it was appropriate at this stage in the evolution of social policy to continue a historic discrimination that between men and women. Um, in RJM, um, uh, in RJM, the issue was, as I said, um, about homelessness as a status and about whether to carry over the, um, the approach into domestic law. But the court, in the shape of a leading judgment by Lord Newberger, didn't simply state the test was manifestly without reasonable foundation. It went on to ask the question of whether or not 
the interference was proportionate. You get a blend of the two tests. And in Humphreys, you get a very similar approach. The test is stated to be, is the discrimination manifestly without reason, reasonable foundation? But that is answered by, Lord, by Lady Hale only on the basis that she says, you must anxiously scrutinize the underlying result. So bear those three things in mind. We now go on, hopefully if I can get to the next slide. Um, I'll go on to what happened subsequently. The issue not having, no challenge having been made to the concept of manifestly without reasonable foundation in the uh, in those early landmark cases, there were then a number of attempts to modify the approach and to persuade the Supreme Court to adopt a different approach. In the first, in the first uh, bedroom tax case, there was an att attempt to do so. And in um, DA, which is the second of the benefit cap cases, there was another attempt to do so. But there appears at the base, at the end of the analysis in DA, to be a final answer in domestic court terms to whether manifestly without reasonable foundation is the appropriate test. And I've set out on the slide a citation from. Lord Wilson's judgment at paragraph 65, where he says, there was and there still remains clear authority both in the Humphreys case and in the bedroom tax case for the proposition that at least in relation to the government's need to justify what would be a discriminatory effect of a rule governing entitlement to welfare benefits. The sole question is whether it is manifestly without reasonable foundation. Let there be no future out about it. Now those may be somewhat ironic words, but one is left at the end of DA on the face of it, the test is simply to ask one question, one question alone, is the discrimination manifestly without reasonable foundation? To a lot of judges that looks like a Wednesday approach, you're just asking is the discrimination, is the a rationale, a reasonable explanation for the discrimination. You don't go any further. But stopping there and without coming to the later developments, that has its own problems. Things to remember are, first of all, that it is for the court, always in an Article 14 case, to decide whether the, whether the discrimination is justified. It's not a process issue. The issue isn't has, isn't, has the executive acted reasonably, but is the answer defensible on whatever the appropriate test is? And um, so that one gets on to getting somewhere beyond just asking, um, uh, um, is there a rationale? That's not enough. And that's borne out by what happened in Humphreys. In Humphreys, Baroness Hale didn't stop at asking, is there an explanation for no splitting, that is not dividing up the benefit uh, between men and women, mums and dads, but does the state's analysis as to why it's maintaining the no splitting rule bear reasonable scrutiny? The answer in Humphreys was yes. So even before the next developments, you begin to see that you, don't, you can't treat the manifestly without reasonable foundation test as simply answered by asking whether there's a rationale uh, for the discrimination. Now, if I can move on to the next slide. Hopefully someone, there we go. Um, there is a possible synthesis beginning to emerge just in domestic terms uh, between the, uh, between the, the two positions of one, a full-blooded proportionality analysis, and secondly, deferring to the executive uh, so that reasonableness becomes the sole test. This is a quote, the, slide, the quote on the slide is from uh, R bracket C, which is the two-child case that Admas talked about earlier, about when, where 
one of the status arguments failed. Indeed, the case, uh, the claimants lost the case altogether. It's, uh, our, the two child case is on its way to the Supreme Court, we'll get there in October, which has permission, there's a hearing lined up uh, in October. So these issues may well be back in front of the Supreme Court again, um, in the light of the development which I'm going to come to in a moment. But Lord Justice Leggett, who gave the uh, judgment in uh, the two-child case, um, put forward the view uh, that you could reconcile the two positions um, by, by, as he's saying, recognising that the explanation may be that the court is required to ask whether the difference in treatment is manifestly disproportionate to the legitimate aim. This would accord with the statement in Blekic that it would accept the judgment of the domestic authorities unless that judgment is manifestly without reasonable foundation. That is, unless the measure employed is manifestly disproportionate to the aim pursued. That quote actually leads you into a very similar position to that adopted by Lord Newberger back in RJM. The test is manifestly without reasonable foundation, but the target is to find out whether the interference is proportionate. And uh, the, you would defer, you the court, defer to the views of the executive unless the measure employed is manifestly disproportionate to the aim pursued. I've seen some Court of Appeal judges post Lord Wilson in DA um, citing uh, Lord Leggett's judgment, Lord Justice Leggett's judgment again. So we may see, I think, that beginning to emerge as a way of squaring the circle. But the next development, so uh, well, let's stop there. I would say it's strongly arguable that's where the whole analysis ends in domestic terms. If we go on, uh, the division is now complicated um, by a somewhat ironic development. We've seen Lord Wilson in the benefit in the bedroom tax case saying that there was only one rule. Um, um, uh, but the bedroom tax case went to Strasbourg, two aspects of it. First of all, the general position of disabled people who claimed the benefit tax generally discriminated against them. But secondly, a much more specific complaint by people who occupied uh, rooms in, the, in converted houses under the sanctuary scheme. The idea being that they could, um, uh, they, uh, they were provided but with effectively a safe room and all sorts of protection um, against uh, against domestic violence. People in the sanctuary scheme won in Strasbourg. They argued, amongst other things, that the whole explanation for Strasbourg's adherence to the manifestly without reasonable foundation test was to be explained on the basis that Steck was concerned with a state uh, adjusting historical discrimination, that is, adjusting over time to the reality of differential pension ages. Um, and basically the court accepted that. Now that looked as if, it, that was just a chamber judgment, it looked as if uh, it might all stop there. But in January 2020, as I explained on the slide, the UK appeal, applied to appeal to the Grand Chamber and the Grand Chamber has refused permission to appeal. So we're now in a situation where Strasbourg appears to be saying Steck is to be explained on one particular basis um, and uh, we'll find out whether Lord Justice Leggett's approach or the new Strasbourg approach triumphs in the fullness of time. Thank you. Um, so I now must hand over uh, to Justin um, to talk about the most recent case. Thank you. Thank you all for, for sticking with me um, and, and, and staying to the end. What will inevitably happen now, having uh, worked perfectly for almost an hour, is my Wi-Fi will give up. Um, I am of the view 
that housing law is the single greatest body of law that, uh, that exists. It is by far the most interesting and by far the most litigious and concerns probably the single most important thing that any individual can have. However, I am aware that not everybody shares this view. So if I can just take a minute to explain what the right to rent legislation is, and then I'll move on to how uh, the JCWI case played out, played out. So the right to rent is an aspect of uh, the hostile environment. You need to go and look at the Immigration Act of 2014 and 2016. And what, it done, what they do, those acts do is they confer upon certain people a right to rent, which means a right to occupy residential uh, premises, whether as a tenant or a licensee. In very simple terms, you have a right to rent if you are a British national or EU national or otherwise lawfully present. And if you're not lawfully present, you don't have a right to rent. But rather than focus on the individual, the way the legislation works is by focusing on landlords. So landlords who uh, let property to someone without a right to rent, and for these purposes, let includes not just tenancies, but licenses, and tenant includes not just tenant, but any occupier. If you're a landlord who does that and you let someone occupy your property when they don't have a right to rent, a number of terrible things happen to you. The first is that uh, subject to a reasonable uh, excuse defense, you commit a criminal, uh, you commit a criminal offense and you can be punished by up to five years imprisonment. The second is that the Secretary of State can serve a fixed penalty notice on you and the Secretary of State can fine you up to £3,000 per contravention. Now, you may not think that sounds a lot, but a contravention where you had three people without a right to rent in the property would be £9,000, because each one is a separate contravention. The right to rent scheme then ties in with the wider regulation of the private rented sector. So if you breach the right to rent provisions as a landlord, you will almost certainly lose your licence under Part 2 or Part 3 of the Housing Act 2004. So you won't be able to rent your property without committing another criminal offence. You'll probably have a banning order made against you, which means you won't be able to uh, rent your property out to anyone uh, at risk of committing an offence. And you'll probably end up on the rogue landlord database, which in turn brings with it a range of other regulatory consequences. You've also got a market based problem. Um, it's almost certainly a breach of the terms of your buy to let mortgage to allow someone in to, to occupy without a uh, without a right to rent. So one of the things that was happening in this litigation um, is trying to explain why the right to rent legislation was causing discrimination. So looking at our second bullet point there, the JCWI and my clients, the uh, Residential Landlords Association, there was copious evidence that the way landlords were responding to the right to rent legislation was in two ways. Firstly, they were saying almost as a condition of the tenancy, show me you've got a British passport. Now that's a very crude way of proving someone passes the right to rent test. Um, and obviously that has the potential to have some, some discriminatory impacts. If you couldn't produce a British passport, then the evidence showed that what they were also doing is adopting proxies and they were preferring people who were white or who had traditional Anglo-Saxon names. Now again no one in this webinar needs to be told why that is why that is at least potentially discriminatory. It's two very very crude responses from the private rented sector landlords to this legislation and we, my clients, we're trying to explain why that happened and essentially it comes down to the nature of the private rented sector. The private rented sector in this country is spectacularly unsophisticated and I say this as the person who was paid to argue on behalf of private landlords. 62% of landlords own only one property and the single fastest growing aspect of the private rented sector is the lodger market. The idea that private landlords, most of whom operate as landlords as a side aspect of their normal job or their normal employment or as a way of chopping up their pension income. The idea that they could identify a Zambrano carer and know that that person has a right to rent is ludicrous. And that is why the sector took a very safety first approach, because it's too hard for them, it's too complicated and the consequences are too great for them if it goes wrong.
So the JCWI brought a judicial review of 2014 and 2016 acts. And what they were alleging is that the, is that the legislative scheme causes landlords to discriminate where they wouldn't ordinarily do so. And that that discrimination infringed articles 8 and 14. Uh, there are um, as the further arguments about uh, Equality Act matters, but we can put those to one side. So essentially, the JCWI are bringing a full on attack on the legislation, saying the legislation is causing unlawful discrimination. The Secretary of State is effectively forcing private individuals to act in a discriminatory way. And my clients intervene to, to explain why landlords are responding to the legislation in this way. Um, and in the High Court, things go spectacularly well. Um, oh, it's not too far. There we are. In the High Court, things go spectacularly. No, just one slide, please. There we are. Things go spectacularly well. The High Court accepts that the right to seek a home, which is what prospective tenants are doing, falls within the ambit of Article 8, and therefore the Article Prohibition, Article 14 Prohibition bites. Where the state interferes with that right to seek a home, it has to do so in a way that does not cause unlawful discrimination. And here, the legislation, and in particular the sanctions, both on the face of the 2014 Act and the wider regulatory framework, and the implications in the market, and the nature of landlords and their ability to respond to this complex legislation, was causing them to discriminate where they otherwise would not wish to do so. So effectively, said the High Court, it was obvious that landlords would adopt this safety first approach. It's a rational response for a very unsophisticated sector to respond in this way. And the Secretary of State is responsible for the discrimination that has caused. Now, unsurprisingly, the Secretary of State was not prepared to let that stand and appeal to the Court of Appeal, which we got the decision about a fortnight ago. And there's a lot in here. The Court of Appeal are prepared to assume that Articles 8 and 14 are engaged. So they don't go quite as far as the High Court, which held that, they held that Article 8 was engaged, but they're prepared to accede, proceed on that basis. So there's a lot of discussion about ambit and about modality cases in here. And ultimately, they slightly duck the question by saying, well, look, because of the result we're about to come to, it doesn't matter, but let's assume they are engaged. Secondly, and the JCWI make, make a big point of this in their material, rightly in my view, they accepted the High Court was right to find that the scheme causes discrimination. Landlords who would otherwise not discriminate on the basis of nationality, ethnicity, are driven to discriminate because of the legislation. But where they differ from the court from the High Court is on the question of justification. Now, there's a lot we could do in here. I'd happily do a whole seminar just on this. But everything that you've heard talked about so far gets flagged up in this judgment. They acknowledge the tension between the tests. Is it proportionality? Is it manifestly without reasonable foundation? And so they're not going to decide that. It doesn't matter because whatever the test, it's justified. On the justification, they come up with two, uh, not, not different, but two discrete lines of argument or decision on justification. The first is that they say it's central importance to the scheme that it's capable of being operated in a non-discriminatory way. Nothing on the face of the act requires discrimination and nothing on the face of the act uh, encourages discrimination. Indeed, to the contrary, the Secretary of State has, has uh, produced a code of guidance that tells you how not to discriminate. The second uh, theme for justification, uh, which they clearly do envisage as a, second, as a separate theme for justification, is very much the line that, we, that was flagged up earlier. This is a question of high policy, debated in Parliament. Immigration law is typically an area reserved for, for Parliament and we respect the judgment of the legislature, not for us to intervene, etc, etc. There's a couple of uh, issues for the future coming out of this. Um, first is JCWI are seeking to go to the Supreme Court uh, and I very much hope they do so and I very much hope we get to go up with them. There's, an, there's a 
in addition to the themes that you've heard talked about already, so watch the test, etc., how do you do justification? I think the really big point in here is about state responsibility for discrimination by third party actors. Because the High Court clearly has no difficulty with the idea that the state is responsible for discrimination by third party actors. And the Court of Appeal accepts that the third party actors are driven to discriminate by the legislation. That's a potentially very, I think, to be a very important point to explore when looking at how citizens respond to legislation. The second bit, and this is a bit more niche, so for the, for the, this is mainly for the housing lawyers who are in there. The fact that the High Court found that the right to seek a home is within the ambit of Article 8, and the Court of Appeal are prepared to assume that's correct, is quite important because in the social housing sector, the Court of Appeal is steadfastly refusing to get into the question of whether or not allocation schemes under Part 6 of the 1996 Act engage Article 8 are within the ambit of Article 8. Because from three separate cases, they dodge the question. H&E, Ling, Warden, Hillingdon, Gulu and Hillingdon. They just refuse to decide that question and say they'll deal with it when it arises. If you've got an allocation scheme based JR, you should, in my view, if the facts remotely support it, always be running the Article 814 point because they've got to decide it eventually. And having decided that with High Court support for the idea that seeking home in the private sector engages Article 8, I would be interested to see why seeking a home in the public sector doesn't engage Article 8 in the same way. Now, you've all been very patient and that is my whittle, whistle, whistle stop tour. I will pause it there and I hand back to Sam to deal with questions. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, Justin, and thank you to all the speakers who have uh, compressed some really quite difficult and interesting issues into uh, small bite-sized chunks, and I hope um, people have found that helpful. We've had a couple of questions in, which I think uh, we can probably deal with. Um, the first question uh, is about proportionality and whether or not a judgment on proportionality is treated in the same way as findings of fact, in the sense that a higher court is unlikely to interfere with it. And I think uh, Richard, I think you um, might want to answer that one. Yes, um, th there's been some recent discussion, which I, for various reasons I'm familiar with, about precisely this issue um, in, uh, in, um, in the Court of Appeal, because it, it arose in the kind of rather nerdy context of transitional arrangements for universal credit to sort of move from legacy benefits such as income support um, and housing benefit on to universal credit. And, uh, Mr Justice Lewis held that the transitional arrangements in one respect uh, were manifestly without reasonable foundation. The Court of Appeal dealt with that, they, they upheld his judgment, they dealt with the issue of proportionality in the guise of the manifestly without reasonable foundation test. Uh, by uh, asking whether he had got it wrong. It's not a, the, the normal approach of the Court of Appeal to a judge um, below. So it's not a binding finding of fact, but a question of whether his approach was wrong. They, went, they said it wasn't necessary to go as far as to say that he needed to have made an error of principle. He simply asked, was he wrong? The references are TP, etc. Uh, against the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, 2020 EWCA Civ 37. And there's some discussion in that. I know it because in a, or in a um, remote hearing 10 days ago, we went over the same ground. No judgment yet, uh, so we'll find out whether the group goes any further. It's a bit of an old chest now because the issue used to arise long, long ago in, for example, the Shops Act. And the issue is whether if magistrates in Rochdale decided uh, that the, uh, the, the uh, requiring the retailers to, shop, to stop on Sunday was disproportionate, whether, that, whether the magistrates in Warsaw could reach the opposite conclusion and what higher courts did about that. And Hoffman delivered a judgment saying that was absurd, you had to have a universally correct answer regardless of what the various first instance decision makers make. So I'm not actually convinced that it is 
proper to treat it as a simple question of fact for the uh, lower tribunal. You have to recognise that you've got to get a nationally correct answer, which is under the control of the higher courts at the end of the day. But there is recent authority. Thank you, Richard. That's really helpful. Um, the next question that, uh, that we've had is uh, whether the UK, um, would the UK depart from the ECHR after Brexit? And if so, what impact may that have? I think perhaps I'll answer that and I can take it quite shortly. Um, I don't think there is currently any plan anymore um, to withdraw from the ECHR certainly was at one point in the political cycles um, when we had discussions about a UK Bill of Rights etc. But um, if there aren't current plans then, um, then obviously the impact, <laughs> there's no impact. But if uh, one was to do that then again the answer would depend of course on whatever it was uh, that replaced um, the ECHR, some sort of Bill of Rights and how that was drafted. So um, I think that probably uh, deals with that reasonably shortly, although maybe not terribly satisfactorily. Uh, and then the final question that we've got on the list here uh, is, I think, a question for you, Justin, um, relating to the RLA research that produced the 5% figure. Justin, can you see? Uh, I, can, I, I can see the question, yeah. So um, at least at the time of the High Court, the all the evidence that the JCWI and the RLA relied upon have been published online. Um, I assume it's still there. When we, are, when we, when we send around the email after all this, I will, make, I will see if it's still online, and if it is, I'll send you a link to where you can download all the statistical analysis. Great, thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Thank you for staying. Um, a, a, um, a link to the recording of this seminar will be sent out in due course, or certainly will be available, and um, I uh, hope everybody has a lovely bank holiday weekend. Bye-bye.